Now I've said that I'm going to take you on a brief journey to start with this morning. So you're going to need your imagination. So get comfy, maybe close your eyes, I don't know. Um, we're going to go overseas for this one. But seeing as we have the liberty of imagination this morning for our travels, we're not going to just travel overseas, we're going to travel back in time. I'm going to take you this morning to a sweltering summer's day in Japan in 1560. So we're talking 500 odd years ago. The air is dripping with humidity. The jungle of Japan is lush and alive. It's humming with the sounds of insects. This is monsoon season. Now in the 1500s, Japan is in the midst of a massive civil war. The entire country is broken up into areas controlled by local warlords, each vying for control of the whole country. Now, in 1560, one warlord who is making a pretty good go of it was Imagawa Yoshimoto. Now, remember in Japan and in many Asian cultures, the family name comes first and then if you like your, what we would think of as your first name or individual name is your actually the second name. So Imagawa is his family name or surname, if you like, and Yoshimoto is what we would call his first name. So I'm going to refer to him as Yoshimoto. Now, Yoshimoto came from a wealthy and militarily powerful family. and He was making conquests right across the, across the country. And now he has his sights set on taking hold of Kyoto. But to do so, he and his army have to cross through an area known as Awari. Awari is not a huge area. It's, it's controlled, it's strategically important, but it's controlled by the Oda family. And this family group, it's a small family group led by Oda Nobunaga. So again, Oda is his family name. Nobunaga is his personal name. Now, Nobunaga was known as a very reckless, unpredictable 26-year-old. Some, some people are saying he's mentally unstable. Uh, in any event, his family is completely insignificant in military terms. Nobunaga can pull together an army of roughly 2,000 men. Yoshimoto, on the other hand, has an army of 20 to 40,000, but up to 40,000 men. So massively, massively bigger than Nobunaga's army. Now I'm hearing, hearing my <laughs> there. <laughs> there we go. All right. So massively bigger army. Yoshimoto has all these resources, all this military might. Nobunaga hears word that Yoshimoto is coming. His army generals, his best advisors tell him there's no use fighting. This is a massive army. They tell him you need to surrender. It's the only sensible thing to do. It's the only way we will save lives. Surrender to Yoshimoto. Well, Nobunaga, he's either very foolish or very courageous. And, you know, sometimes there's a fine line between the two because he is determined to take on Yoshimoto's army. So on June 11, and you remember they're in the Northern Hemisphere, so this is monsoon season, as I, as I said. This is summer, it's sweltering, it's steamy and humid in the jungles of Japan. And on June 11, Nobunaga sets up camp at a temple fortress known as Zen Shoji. I'm doing all right with these names, by the way, because I studied Japanese for a few years at school. Like, it's tongue twisters, a few of them. But um, anyway, Yoshimoto, he arrives with his troops at this Zen, Zen Shoji camp shortly afterwards. And with almost no effort, he completely destroys the camp 
at Zen Shoji, just as Yoshimoto knew he would. He knew it would be an easy win. And so he encourages his men to eat and drink the loot in celebration. But what Yoshimoto doesn't know is that the camp at Zen Soji was a dummy army, a decoy. A few days later on the 22nd of June, Nobunaga and the rest of his army make their move. Now a thunderstorm is rolling in. The thunder is just rippling through that thick, humid air. And the approaching storm silences the approach of Nobunaga's army as they stealthily move down from the hills around Zenshoji. Suddenly, they charge this drunk and unprepared army. So remember, they were, they were drinking and eating the loot. They were drunk. They were not prepared. Startled, Yoshimoto's men start running in every direction, leaving Yoshimoto, the leader of this army, massive army, completely unprotected. Now, Yoshimoto himself has no clue what's happening. He thinks there's just some squabble between some of his drunken men. And he is run through before he even realizes what's going on. Nobunaga's tiny army won the battle within just two hours. Now, this is an engaging military story. It's amongst some of the most remarkable and unexpected defeats in history. You can look it up on Google and, and read about it yourself. It's pretty, pretty incredible. But let's be honest, war is an ugly and brutal affair. As Rex mentioned in his prayer, many of us are remembering September 11, 20 years ago. And of course, the, the war that ensued after that, a 20 year long war. You know, war is ugly, but it can be easy to forget that you and I are living in the time of the greatest war of eternity. You and I are on the front lines of a raging war. And yet for all its brutality and all its casualties, many of us forget that it's even happening. Now, there are two, two aspects of what I want to share with you today. Firstly, I want to take a little bit of time to look at what this war is. And then I want to take a little bit of time to look at what you and I are doing about it. So let's, let's refresh our minds on where this war began. If you've got your Bibles or your iPhones, whatever you're using, please turn over to Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to read from verse 7. So Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is a war that began in heaven. This is a war that started in heaven. And of course, in a war, you have two opposing sides. In this case, we have God and his angels on one side, and we have Satan and his angels on the other side. Now, we don't have time to go into this in detail today, but Satan himself, we find in the Bible, was originally one of the perfect heavenly angels, a leading angel who turned against God and deceived one third of the angels of heaven into joining his rebellion. Now in verse seven here, the, the word that's translated as war is polemos in the Greek. And that's a word that uh, we get words like polemic or politics from in our English language. So this kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of the type of war that Satan launched against God. It wasn't, uh, primarily a war of physical engagement. It wasn't uh, a physical war, although it was just as destructive. This was a political war, a propaganda campaign, um, a character assassination. 
Satan waged his war by disseminating lies regarding who God is. And he's described as the one here in verse 9 who deceives the whole world. You know, Jesus says that you know, Satan is a liar and the father of it. All this mistruth about God is coming from the enemy. Now, if you want to hold on to your Bibles, because we're going to jump around a little bit. Um, if you want to turn over to 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14, we have a sobering reminder of this enemy and the tactics that he use, uses. So 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 11 and verses 13 and 14. For such are false prophets, sorry, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself trans transforms himself into an angel of light. So this is, a, this is an enemy who portrays himself as an angel of light, who tries to, uh, you know, he de he's deceitful and he's trying to present himself as the righteous one. He's trying to uh, bring down the character of God and exalt himself. Revelation uh, 12, 9, where we just were a moment ago, says that Satan was cast to the earth. Now, we know that God created human beings in his own image. You know, we're told in Genesis 1 um, that he created men and women in the image of God. Um, you're welcome to jump over there with me. As I say, I'm going to be moving around the Bible a little bit. So um, if it's probably if you want to look them up, you're welcome to. If you want to listen, that's okay. Uh, so Genesis chapter 1 and verses... 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God has created these human beings in his image and he's given humanity dominion over the earth. But what happens in that fall when, when Eve is tempted, Satan claims victory over humanity and claims the dominion that God gave. Now, we can see that in the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Luke 4, verses 5 and 6. This is where Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. So verse 5, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. So Satan has claimed this dominion. He has claimed the dominion that was given to humanity as his own. You see, you and I are living on war ground. You and I are living in disputed territory. You and I are on the front lines of this conflict. Now, I think it can be easy to forget that we are in the midst of a fierce spiritual conflict at times, especially when things are going well for us. I think, you know, maybe the pandemic at the moment is bringing things to the fore a little bit more. But even then, I think we can tend to get so focused on, you know, what the governments are doing and the restrictions and the vaccines and the debates that we can so easily lose sight of the spiritual side of what's happening and how easy it is to be like Yoshimoto and assume that because seem, things are seem, seem fairly easy, that we can kick back and relax. And I wonder, are we in danger of enjoying the spoil while the enemy creeps up on us? Or maybe when things are tough, do we get so consumed in the immediate issues that we forget the big picture? Do we end up fighting and arguing with each other you know, with family, with friends, getting annoyed, getting frustrated with our circumstances, 
that we lose sight of where we are in history and what it's all about. Now, this is not to dismiss the struggles that each of us face, but those struggles are not won by fighting it out with those around us. Now, I can tell you personally that the spiritual world is very real. I had, this is not something I share with a lot of people, but I had the unfortunate experience in my childhood and early teens of encountering the dark side of the spiritual world firsthand. My family at the time had become involved in occult practices and the things that happened in our home growing up would give you shivers. Um, as an example, I remember being, um, when I was about nine years old, my seven-year-old sister and I would wa often wake it around dawn and we would hear the sound of voices in the, in the lounge room. Um, on occasion, I know my parents would hear these voices too. And they were the sound of adults speaking together. But when my sister and I rushed out to see what we thought must have been mum and dad or maybe the TV on or something, um, we would find the room completely empty, the house asleep, the TV off. There was no doubt that spiritual beings frequented our home. Um, because of some of the younger members of our audience today, I'm not going to share more details with you. But what I can tell you is that the dark side of the spiritual world don't play nice and that Jesus is the only way out. The war we are talking about is a very, very real one. One that I have seen play out in my home as a child firsthand. So let's look a little bit more about this war. We know this is a war that started in heaven. We know that we are on the battleground, if you like. Um, we're told that our enemy is the one who deceives the whole world. What is the big argument that's going on? What is, what is being fought over? You see, we mentioned it briefly, God's character is under attack. God is the one, if you like, who is on trial. The enemy has challenged the character and goodness of God. And we see it right from the very first sin. So if you want to jump over to Genesis chapter 3, a passage that we're probably all very familiar with, but let's revisit Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the enemy incites doubt, he incites distrust of God. He suggests that we need to stand up for our own rights. We need to take things into our own hands. He, he twists God's word out of context, just as he does in the temptations of Jesus. He claims that the fruit would make Eve wise. He suggests that God has held something back from her, that, that God doesn't have her best interests at heart. And it's interesting in Isaiah 14, and feel free to look this up in your own time. It tells us, Isaiah 14 tells us a bit about how the rebellion in heaven started. And we see in Isaiah 14 that Satan's rebellion started with the same, I will be like God. He challenged God's right to rule. He challenged God's goodness. And here in this temptation with Eve, he's tempting Eve to want to be like God. And it's interesting, but he accuses God of the very motives that he actually had. Satan was all about self-exaltation, of selfishness, 
of me first. And that is exactly what he claims or accuses God of. And it's an interesting thing in life that we often accuse others or suspect others of the things that we're most likely to do ourselves. Jesus says that Satan is the father of lies in John 8, 44. Every maligning of God's character comes from Satan. Every false perception of God comes from Satan. Now, this is a very real war, but it is a war that we do not have to have fear in because Jesus has already won the war. We have victory. We have freedom from fear. Um, let's jump over to John chapter 1 and verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, when Jesus came to earth, his life his death and his resurrection were the ultimate display of God's character. They told us who God is. They revealed to us the heart of God. Romans 8.32 tells us that the death of Christ proves that God will not hold any good thing back from us. And this is the ultimate answer to the the original temptation in Genesis 3, the suggestion that God is holding something back from us. No, he will not and he did not hold back anything from us. So this was our scripture reading this morning and thank you to Noah for reading it. Um, let's jump over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And it's a beautiful chapter. We're going to read, um, it's it's a reasonably long passage, uh, Romans chapter 8 from verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, we do not need to have fear no matter what is happening. We know that all things work together for good. For, wh for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated, he also, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. The war has been won. The enemy has no power over us. There is complete and absolute freedom and deliverance and victory in Christ. I want you to hold on to that thought as we shift to what we do about the war, because unlike our friend Yoshimoto, we need to keep alert. We need to remember that we are fighting a war. Um, there is a, there's a Christian song, and I, I can't remember who sings it, but it has a line in it, the battle still rages, but the war has been won. Christ has won the victory, 
and we have to claim that victory. The enemy will try to deceive us and strip us of that victory. We're not home yet. So how do we fight against an invisible enemy? How do we, in practical terms, claim the victory that has been won for us? This is our, our final passage, really, that I, I want you to turn to. Um, but we're going to spend a little bit of time on it, and that is Ephesians chapter 6. So please turn over to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. And you might be familiar with this passage, um, but it's a very relevant one when we're talking about spiritual warfare, when we're talking about this great controversy that we're in. So Ephesians chapter 6 and picking up from verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armour so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Let's not forget what we are dealing with. Let's not get distracted by what we see around us. Let's not get confused about the, what battles we are fighting. Paul has some advice for us to help us face the battle. He says to put on the full armour of God, not part of it, but all of it. You know, if you, if you leave a piece of your armour behind when you go into battle, you, you have a weak area that's easily targeted. And believe me, the enemy will target that area. So let's read about this, this armour. What is this armour? So the first, first piece of the armour says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. So a girdle or a, this is like a belt. A belt holds everything else together. And this is the belt of truth. Now, first and foremost, this refers to the truth of scripture as opposed to the lies of Satan. Remember, we saw that Satan is the father of lies in John 8, 44. And Jesus says uh, in that passage just a few verses earlier that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You see, the great truths of scripture, the love of God, the forgiveness, the free gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, the revelation of the character of God through the person of Jesus. These truths set us free from Satan's lies. Satan would have us believe that we are sinful, lost, without hope, that God is judgmental, harsh and exacting. The truth is that God's love and salvation are abundant and that they have set us free. Now, I think there is a second aspect to this belt of truth, which is our personal commitment to truth. That's living a life that's upright, that's transparent, that's, that's without deceit. Integrity and honesty are vital to your Christian life. Now let's look at this next piece of the armour. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, of course, a breastplate covers the heart. It shields your heart and your other vital organs. The righteousness of Christ protects you against all of Satan's accusations and charges. Now, this righteousness is not made up of the good deeds that you do. Those will not and cannot protect you. The Bible is very clear that none of us are righteous in ourselves and you don't need to, to look far to see that. You know, Romans 3.10, um, you know, this, basically the entire book of Romans will teach you that. But the breastplate of righteousness is entirely the righteousness of Jesus, which he gives us freely when we accept him as our saviour. This is what covers us. This is what protects us. The next piece of armour and having your feet shod 
with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, Isaiah 52, 7, I think, ties in, this, in with this so beautifully. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. Wherever you go, wherever your feet take you, be ready. Be prepared to share the message of hope, of peace, that we can have peace and reconciliation with God, that salvation is available freely to each of us. And when you share, your own faith and experience is strengthened. Now, the next piece of armour, we are told, above all, taking the shield of faith, which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Above all, that is an indication of the importance of this shield of faith, above all. We know in Hebrews 11 that we're told that it's impossible to please God without faith, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. It is by faith that we take hold of the gift of salvation. It is by faith that we quench the darts of the enemy. Romans 12, 3 tells us that every single person is given a measure of faith. And then as we walk with him, that faith grows, it develops, and it protects us and allows us to live a victorious life in Christ. It is by faith that we claim the victory that Christ has won for us. And, you know, this was Paul's experience. You know, he said in Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And at the end of that life of faith, he declares, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And this can be your experience as well as you use that shield of faith to turn aside everything that Satan hurls at you. Remember, your faith is in him. It's not in what you want. It's not in an outcome that you have your heart set on. Your faith is in Jesus. Your faith is in God and his goodness. All right. Then we have the next piece of armour. And take the helmet of salvation. Now, of course, the helmet protects our mind. When we have a sure knowledge of our salvation and the goodness of God, when we glimpse the character of God, we will not be moved by Satan's deceptions. When we are certain that we are in Christ and our sins are forgiven, we will have a peace that nothing can disturb. And I think, you know, so many of us wrestle with this question at times. Uh, are we saved? Can we be certain that we are saved and the enemy really gets into our minds on this ground. But, you know, we can be sure because our certainty isn't grounded in ourselves and how well we are doing. It's grounded in him and his goodness. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has given us eternal life and we don't need to doubt that. Now, we've covered five pieces of armour. There are just two pieces left to cover. Now, those first five pieces of armour, you might notice they're all defensive pieces of armour. They're all pieces of armour to protect us. The last two pieces of armour are also offensive pieces of armour. They can be used to attack and not just protect. All right. So the next piece of armour and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God's word. The Bible is described as in, in Hebrews 4.12 as living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus used this weapon when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. You know, every, every time Satan tried to lead Jesus into sin, Jesus answered, it is written. 
He relied entirely on God's word. God's word is truth. It is powerful. And it's why we need to study the Bible and know it personally for ourselves. The sword not only protects us, it also destroys our enemy. It conquers the territory that the enemy has has claimed as his own. Now, the second piece of offensive, if you like, armour is prayer. And sometimes we read this passage and we we don't read this last little bit here as part of the armour of God. But this is the seventh piece and it is certainly a piece of our armour prayer we read here praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints prayer is not to be neglected it is a powerful piece of our armor in this war let's not be like yoshimoto and his army distracted enjoying the easier moments of battle, letting our guard down, drunken with pleasures, deaf to the sound of the spiritual assault that is upon us every day. Yoshimoto didn't even know he was in battle until it was too late. Do not be Yoshimoto. As Jesus said, watch, be on guard, be sober, prayerful. We are in a war. Now, Jesus has won the ultimate victory for us by conquering death and the power of sin. He has proven the goodness and love of God toward us. But don't forget that we have a very real enemy who would like to prevent us running the race and taking hold of the victory that Jesus has won. Verse 